Understanding creation, how can I live without all the answers? We have been going through um, the book Understanding Creation, edited by uh, James Gibson and uh, uh, Umberto Rossi. And uh, there are 20 chapters. We're discussing chapter 20, although we'll come back for the one on radiometric dating next week. Um, <coughs> those are intended to be questions uh, that are answered on a standalone basis, although obviously there will be some uh, interrelationships between the questions. And uh, the initial uh, request was for 1,800 to 2,400 words, and I think this is another chapter where the uh, uh, word limit was observed. The question this week is, how can I live without all the answers? It's written by Gary Burdick. And for those of you who don't know, Gary Burdick got a physics and mathematics degree from Southern Adventist University. I'm sure it was Southern uh, Union College at the time. Um, and received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. He held postdoctoral in, uh, positions in France, Hong Kong, and Virginia, and then joined La Sierra University, then moved to Andrews University in 1999, where he's currently professor of physics and associate dean for research. His particular area of research, optical spectroscopy, dealing with uh, electronic transitions of uh, lanthanide elements that relate to light, either emitting or absorbing, um, in solid state media. And uh, he has established international collaborations with various research labs and has more than 40 reference scientific publications and many international conference presentations on his work. So that's kind of his background. And uh, the question that he deals with is, uh, in a way, kind of like the last one we had uh, two weeks ago, almost too easy to answer. Uh, nobody has the answers. And if we're going to live, we'd better have uh, be able to live without all the answers. And, uh, and uh, in point of fact, we still live without all the answers. So uh, you just simply, you know, you deal with it. Um, uh, Burdick makes four observations that he's found to be helpful, and uh, we'll pay attention to those as we go through and then afterwards. Recognize that every discipline has its own unanswered questions. Investigate the ramifications for each discipline of accepting the truths of uh, the other discipline. Keep the discussion going. And finally, recognize what is most important. And uh, we'll be going through those, uh, his observations, mine, and then you can uh, chime in with your observations. Um, Burdick begins this chapter with a quote from Deuteronomy 29.29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. If we had perfect knowledge of our science and our theology, if we had perfect knowledge, our science and our theology would never be in conflict because the same God who reveals himself through scripture has also revealed himself through his creation. And God is not in conflict with himself, a relatively uncontroversial position. Thus, when we see conflict between our best theology and our best science, we should recognize this merely indicates our lack of complete understanding. As one well-known Christian geologist states, um, and the uh, Christian the, uh, geologist happens to be Dave, Davis Young. Because scripture and the created universe are both God-given, they cannot be in conflict. They form one comprehensive, unified, coherent whole that is an expression of the character and will of our creator and redeemer, who is the author of both. Nature and scripture form a unity because God himself is one. The Bible and nature sometimes seem to be unrelated to one another, in competition with one another, or even in conflict with one another. 
Such disjunctions, however, lie not between the Bible and the created order, but rather between human understanding of the Bible and human understanding of nature. It is human interpretations of God-given data that lead into discrepancy, conflict, and disagreement. When Christ returns to earth, we hope to gain greater understanding and have some, though perhaps not all, of our questions answered. Um, there's some indication that we may be learning throughout all eternity. Until then, how should we live with unanswered questions? Following are four responses that I have found to be helpful. One, recognize that every discipline has its own unanswered questions. In theology, Christians struggled for centuries to understand exactly who Jesus is. It was clear from his life that Jesus was a human being who experienced hunger and felt pain like all humans. It was also clear that Jesus was divine and accepted the worship of those he healed. How could Jesus be both human and divine at the same time? It is a great mystery. Although the Council of Nicaea defined this mystery for the early Christian church, stating that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine, this did not explain how one person could be both divine and human simultaneously. Science also has its unanswered questions. For example, <clears throat> what is light? For centuries, physicists struggled to understand its character. Some experiments indicated that light consists of discrete particles, while other experiments showed that light is spread out in, like waves, uh, in waves. It wasn't until the development of quantum mechanics in the 20th century that scientists understood light to be a quantum mechanical wave packet that can exhibit wave-like or particle-like features depending on the experiment that is selected. And sometimes both in rapid succession. However, this only defines the mystery. It does not completely answer the question because it is not clear exactly what quantum mechanics tells us about the nature of reality. Most scientists and engineers are willing to accept the results of quantum mechanics without thinking too much about the philosophical questions of what light really is. Quantum mechanics explains the results of our experiments extremely well and has been successfully used to develop many important technological devices such as the laser, the transistor, magnetic resonance imaging, or as it's more popularly known, MRI, and perhaps in the future, high-speed quantum computers. However, this still leaves unanswered the question of what light really is prior to being measured in an experiment. The answer is unimportant for the development of technology. For this reason, the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics has been characterized as the shut up and calculate interpretation. Meaning don't worry about the philosophical ramifications of quantum mechanics, just use it. And uh, as a sidelight, I might mention that Einstein worried a great deal about the philosophical uh, implications of quantum mechanics and therefore tried desperately to prove that uh, it didn't really answer all the questions. Both theology and science have unanswered and perhaps unanswerable questions. But these are mysteries that are worth struggling with and trying to understand because they point to some of the most important fundamental truths about God and reality. Given that each discipline has unanswered questions at its core, we should not be surprised to find that attempts to reconcile science and theology leads to additional unanswered questions. This does not mean that science and theology are at war or that one side must win and the other lose. Rather, this provides yet another indication that God and reality are greater than we can comprehend. We need to recognize that these conflicts may point to important underlying truths. Resolution may not come easily, and these conflicts may not be completely resolvable in this life. But it is worth the attempt to better understand both God and his creations. Point two. Investigate the ramifications for each discipline of accepting the truths of the other discipline. 
I think this is an important point. It is important to ask, what would be the ramifications to our theology if we were to accept certain current scientific theories? Theologians after the time of Galileo found no violation of fundamental theological principles in accepting that the earth orbits the sun rather than the sun orbiting the earth. Biblical statements that appeared to be in conflict with the moving earth, for example, Joshua's command that the sun stand still, were reinterpreted without damaging either of the important points being made in the text or the underlying theology. I think that uh, that's the way it reads. Uh, I think it should say either the important points, uh, but uh, you, you can judge how that should come out. In cases like this, a clear understanding of scripture can resolve conflicts. In other cases, the prevailing scientific theory may be found to be incompatible with scripture. This is continuing the same paragraph, by the way, just too big to fit on all in one. However, in either case, the examination process helps reaffirm the most important theological points. This does not mean that theologians must accept all scientific theories, nor that science trumps theology. But in some cases, conflict can be avoided by recognizing that an apparent conflict need not exist. Likewise, it is important for Christians who are scientists to investigate the ramifications of Christian belief for science. Some of the best science has been carried out by individuals willing to think outside the box and inve investigate non-conventional hypotheses and theories. The greatest accomplishment of 19th century physics was James Clerk Maxwell's development of electromagnetic field theory. Maxwell, a devout Christian, credited his understanding of the dynamic relationship of the triune God as an analogical truth that helped him to develop his dynamic electromagnetic field theory. Um, quoting uh, Torrance, it was not that Clerk Maxwell imported theological conceptions as such into his science, but that it was the slant of his deeply Christian mind informed by faith that exercised a guiding role in the choice and formation of his leading scientific concepts. And by the way, uh, Clerk Maxwell's theory was very difficult to visualize in terms of mechanics. Um, it's arguable that it's actually impossible to understand by standard mechanics. And it was one step outside of the uh, mechanical view of the universe. Number three, keep the discussion going. In both theology and science, some of the most important truths arise out of conflict and contradiction. The proponents of Christ's humanity and the proponents of Christ's divinity both had to be heard. We would never have developed a complete picture of the nature of Christ if one side had been allowed to defeat and silence the other. Likewise, we would never have developed quantum mechanics if the scientists who believed that light was made of discrete particles had been allowed to defeat and silence the scientists who believed that light was made out of waves or vice versa. Even though in some cases we may not see how our understanding of science and our understanding of theology relate to each other, we cannot afford to silence either voice. Albert Einstein recognized the need for science and theology to talk with each other in his expression, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. Now that, of course, comes from Einstein. Uh, that is, science must ultimately look outside itself to religion for a sense of meaning, and religion is ultimately about all of reality, not just the spiritual, and thus it should not ignore the physical world. This relationship has been embraced by the physicist and theologian John Polkinghorne. People who are seeking to serve the God of truth should welcome all truth from whatever source it may come, without fear or reserve. Included in this open embrace must certainly be the truths of science. In the case of the scientists, the same insight implies that if they want to pursue the search for understanding through and through, a quest that is most 
uh, that it is, I think that's supposed to be it, is most natural for them to embark upon. They will have to be prepared to go beyond the limits of science itself in the search for the widest and deepest context of intelligibility. I think that this further quest, if openly pursued, will take the inquirer in the direction of religious belief. And he has the citation from Polkenhorn. Number four, and I omitted the number, but he didn't, recognize what is most important. Although we, would, although we would like all of our questions answered, Jesus made it clear that he came to heal and to save, and that this was more important than answering questions. When his disciples met a man blind from birth, they asked why he was born blind, whether it was because of his own sin or his parents' sin. And of course, that's uh, from John 9. Um, Jesus' response was that the man's blindness was not due to either cause, but he did not address the underlying assumption that advers uh, adversities such as this man's blindness were judgment from God because of sin. Rather, he simply stated that God's glory would be manifested through the man's blindness and proceeded to heal the man. Solving the problem was far more important to Jesus than providing an explanation. As the theologian Thomas Tracy states, and of course he'll give the reference, uh, the good news proclaimed in the New Testament is that God has acted to liberate and redeem, not that God has offered us a satisfactory accounting of why things are as they are. We long for both liberation and comprehension, though neither is within our power, and it is no surprise that the promise of God's unfailing love is a matter of more urgent concern, that's my typo, I'm sure, than that the pro than the than the prospect of a fuller explanation. As the Gospel writers proceed to count, recount the sufferings and death of Jesus, no explanation is given for the existence of sin, suffering, and death, only that through Jesus' suffering and death we can be saved. Ellen White wrote, and that's from the Great Controversy, it is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Sin is an intruder, for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could an excuse for it be found, or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. Thus, although we would like to understand why the world is as it is, ultimately the gospel message is that the world needs redemption and that a better world awaits us. Salvation is more important than explanation. And he comes to his conclusion. Uh, Frank Hazel has made the point that in science as well as in theology, humility is one of the rarest yet most important characteristics and presuppositions of those engaged in the study of both. Um, and he gives a reference. It's a ministry magazine. Science provides powerful tools to understand the intricate de details of God's creation. However, as scientists push the edges of the disciplines to search for a more complete picture of the universe, they come to recognize that their explanations reveal an underlying reality that is still inexplicable. Thus, the true scientist is constrained by his discipline to be humble. The theologian is similarly constrained. The Bible provides a reliable and trustworthy account of how God has interacted with people throughout history. It provides all that is needful for salvation. However, not all questions about God's nature are answered. There's always something more for the theologian to learn about God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Uh, the theologians striving for a complete picture of the transcendent God, likewise, requires humility. Both the scientist and the theologian see through a glass darkly. We see enough to gain certain knowledge regarding what God has revealed about himself in his creation. However, the picture is still but a shadow of the reality. 
We look forward to the time when we will see clearly a more complete picture and join our disciplinary perspectives. For to learn about God's creation is also to learn about God. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now, my reaction to uh, his uh, answer. Uh, the generic answer, as I said before, is almost too easy. Nobody has all the answers. Answers should be tested on the other side's turf. Don't prematurely shut down the discussion and recognize what is most important. I'm in agreement with all those. But the real question, I think, and it's not at least as far as I can tell addressed by the uh, article, is how should this be implemented in the case of the creation controversy? That is, the book is called Understanding Creation. It's not about general um, science religion issues. Uh, Burdick quotes from Einstein, Davis Young, and Ralph Sterley, Thomas Torrance, John Polkinghorne, Thomas Tracy, <coughs> Ellen White, and Frank Hazel, as well as the Bible. Um, Einstein is a um, theist of a sort. Davis Young is a conservative Christian but old age believer. Um, probably on the side of theistic evolution. Uh, Thomas Torrance uh, uh, and Thomas Tracy, I'm not familiar with their positions, but they certainly don't sound like a, a short age creationist. Uh, John Polkinghorne is definitely a long age uh, uh, creationist. Ellen White and Frank Hosel, on the other hand, are short age. Um, it's hard to tell where he's coming from when he makes those kinds of general statements. Um, I don't know where he, certainly uh, on the basis of that article, I don't know where he stands on the issues involved with creation. What do we do with time uh, and so forth? Um, is he arguing that we really don't know about the timing of creation and shouldn't take any position but simply explore options? Is he arguing that short age creationists shouldn't be expected to have all the answers, that long agers should allow them to participate in the discussion, and that long agers should explain theological difficulties in their own model? Or is he perhaps arguing that long agers should be given room in Adventist institutions and short agers don't have all the answers and that short agers should worry more about salvation and less about creation? Uh, you can take him any way you want. Now, my own perspective on that is that <coughs> his number one observation recognized that every discipline has its own unanswered questions. I think that short ages should not panic if they, if they do not have all the answers because that's expected. Short ages should not also, should not be surprised if they fire a silver bullet and long ages act like it's just another anomaly. Because the long ages are doing the exact same thing. And the truth of the matter is these things don't tend to go away after one crucial experiment. In fact, there are arguments that can be made. I don't happen to completely buy them. But I think there are arguments that can be made that people believe what they want to theologically and that the, the scientific evidence makes very little difference. Um, investigate the ramifications for each discipline of accepting the, quote, truths of the other discipline. Um, I, I think that more attention needs to be paid to the effect of scrapping the Genesis account or massively modifying it. Uh, what, what that effect would have on scriptural authority, the Sabbath, God's interaction with the world, the atonement, the second coming, and for that matter, the centrality of love in God's uh, universe. I think that also that it's true that more experiments need to be done testing short age theories. I think we're starting to do more of that and I think it's paying off uh, rather well. 
uh, keep the discussion going. I think that short agers should engage long agers who should reciprocate. That's one of the reasons why sometime later in April uh, we're going to have uh, the authors of God, Sky, and Land here, uh, assuming that they're willing to come. And uh, uh, they'll get to make their case, and, uh, and uh, I'll get to make some observations, and uh, uh, you guys will get to participate in the conversation. I think that it's important for us not to form our own little ghetto and only talk to our own people. Um, but I think also, <coughs> excuse me, that part of the discussion is long ages should not complain if short ages want their own research and teaching institutions, because to to uh, to give everything over to long ages is not to keep the discussion going. And finally, I think that um, it's important that we do recognize what's most important. Um, Gary Burdick could have cited the example of Job, where when God answered Enum out of the whirlwind, he didn't give him a detailed explanation of what ha why bad things happen to good people. He just said, look at this, Job. Um, can you not recognize that I'm in control and that I know so much more than you do? And that um, uh, rather than understanding, you need more trust. Um, but I think also it's true that the story of salvation is more important than our theories about nature, and destroying that story is worse than a temporary inaccuracy in our theories of how things were created. And if you can't come to me with a good long age story that will explain the plan of salvation, then we're destroying what's most important. And with that, I will see what you people think. Yeah, I would have. Um, uh, change the title somewhat. In fact, as I was considering the title, it seemed to me that it, it ought to have been re reworded. How can I live if I cannot trust? How can I trust if I don't have any answers? Or do I need to trust if I have all the answers? Uh, issues of trust come in specifically when we don't have all the answers. And then you immediately ask the question, but what do I find most trustworthy? And if we think in those terms, then we have to ask the question, all right, well, what's behind that choice? Why do I find, say, God more trustworthy? than some other alternative. And many people, some even Adventists, will immediately jump on this and say, well, but we don't really have the evidence to uh, put our trust in God. And I'm thinking, okay, in which case, what are you doing here? Is that not the logical sequel of a question? You see, what troubles me about this chapter is not so much the merits of the points raised and the conclusions reached, all of which are good, but they seem to, they seem to be dealing with the foot soldier arguments rather than the generals. And I would much rather face the generals of arguments rather than waste time with foot soldiers who are just essentially sent out like cannon fodder while we hide the generals 
behind various defenses somewhere so that they can be preserved no matter what. And I'm asking myself, what generals are worthy of that kind of protection? Um. Well, I agree, and that's one of the reasons why I felt like this was a wonderful exercise in a general answer that's kind of not exceptional or uh, exceptionable. Uh, it's a great answer, but uh, but implementing it in uh, this particular setting, I think, would have been much more helpful. And that's one of the reasons why, when I got done, I tried to to implement it from a short age perspective. Now, I'm going to give one other reason and, and just, uh, I, I think that it's important that even wrong answers uh, are allowed to be out there. And the reason why I say that is, in the biography of a number of good men, uh, Henry Morris being one of them, uh, John Sanford, who spoke here last week, being another, you find that they made the transition from uh, mechanistic evolution doesn't have all the answers to short age creationism going through a, uh, well, God did it, but it took a long time uh, kind of position. If we shut that position down, stomp on it, lock, stock, and barrel it, you can't even uh, consider that idea. I think we will have people who will not be able to make the transition in one giant step. step. And I think it's a mistake for us to insist that everybody uh, gets converted to the total truth all at once. Most of us learn things step by step. Uh, I know that, uh, that my own views have changed slightly with uh, time and, ev and uh, evidence. And I'm not sure that uh, I can expect anybody else to do it that much faster than I did. Uh, some people may. Most people probably won't. And so I think it's important for us, even when we are right and they're wrong, not to shut down the conversation too fast. Because there are people who need that temporary stopping point. Um, now, I, having said that, I, I feel this very strongly that there are two things that are not happening that need to happen. And one of the reasons for this class is that I'm trying my best to change that. Uh, number one, I think it's important for us to talk to each other, not just at each other or not just behind each other's back. And number two is that I feel that the attempt to gain control of institutions and, and uh, install, uh, install a position and hold it against all comers, uh, while typically attributed to conservatives, and sometimes we are guilty of that, uh, is in this modern age, more likely to come from liberals. And that Adventist institutions are there as an attempt to give a conservative position somewhere to rest. And the attempt to make everything liberal is basically a way of shutting down the conversation. And I think it's a huge mistake philosophically, um, and it's wrong. And I think there is a place for conservative institutions who <coughs> want to uh, uphold a particular view of things. 
Uh, and I don't think that it's right for, uh, for liberals to try to convert those institutions into something else. Uh, because that's part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. If you do that to everything, then there is no conservative uh, research, there is no conservative voice, there is no, nobody to speak for conservatives, mm -hmm. except as uh, God raises it up outside of institutions, which I suppose he can do. But I'm not sure that that's his first choice. But anyway, that's my own uh, Science is large, seemingly inexhaustible. Religion in this particular chapter is very confined to Christianity. In fact, most people of the earth practice something else, have all kinds of gods and philosophies. So we must ask ourselves, how did this come about? And of course, our answer is, well, paganism comes from the devil. There was a war in heaven, there's a devil. These questions are not addressed, but they're very real and present. And today, even Adventism is beginning to take from some of these, quote, pagan religions, aspects of faith that are dangerous. Spiritualism is infiltrating our philosophy as well. So this question is much bigger than this chapter proposed. Although I think that in our society in uh, the United States, Canada, and Western Europe, um, the biggest threat to Christianity is science. And if I can put it that way, the biggest threat to atheistic science is, in fact, Christianity. And so and, uh, their concern, I think, is uh, in one sense merited. Uh, Richard Dawkins doesn't really have to contend with Islamics that much, although as time goes on, he may. Uh, considering what's happening in uh, Great Britain. Um, but um, if you don't count Islamics, really, um, uh, Buddhists or Hindus mostly just kind of shrug over the theory of evolution. And they may believe it and they may not. And they don't feel it necessary to defend their belief on scientific grounds. I will say that there's a guy by the name of Cremo. I, I want to say Richard Cremo, but I'm not sure, um, who has noticed a lot of out-of-place artifacts that uh, um, old, older than people expected to have, and uses them as arguments not for a recent creation, with man going back further in the geologic column than was expected, uh, but rather that the ages have been there and that humans have been around during the whole time. In other words, instead of saying humans and dinosaurs cohabited uh, uh, 5,000 years ago, let's say, he's saying that they, uh, were, to, they were in the same world perhaps uh, 65 million years ago. So it's an entirely different kind of approach. But other than him, I haven't really seen a lot of, of uh, Hindu responses to the theory of evolution. Um, I think that, that uh, atheistic scientists rightly perceive <coughs> that conservative Christianity is the biggest threat they have. Even though numerically, uh, I think you could make the case that perhaps one uh, quarter of the world is actually Christian, uh, maybe even slightly less. <coughs> uh, 
uh, seems to me in, in the conversation, we need to keep in mind the, the tremendous bias that there is in the scientific literature. Now, we, we need to look at this. We need to study it. We need to understand it. But we also need to keep in mind that we're not approaching this from a level playing field and that part of our concern of uncertainty is not due to the data itself, it is due to the bias and in interpretation. And, uh, you know, we have probably half a million scientists in the world, roughly. Uh, not all those that are involved in research and so on. We probably have uh, just a handful of active scientists espousing creation. Uh, on the other hand, we have the very surprising uh, figure that you know, four out of ten scientists believe in a God that answers prayer, at least uh, scientists in the United States, uh, scientists listed in American Men and Women of Science, anyway, uh, believe in their prayer. And uh, as we look at this whole picture of uncertainty, we need to keep in mind that the dominance of a paradigm here, a secular paradigm, it doesn't allow God in the picture. Uh, demands that you keep a materialistic philosophy uh, and be very strict about that. Otherwise, we will expel you from the scientific community. Uh, uh, so this is part of the part of the picture of the uncertainty. I think that uh, people face at times. And you know, well, uh, uh, you hear these statements go. All the radioactive dates agree with each other, you, and so on. Uh, uh, and so, uh, this is overwhelming, and so on and so forth. That, you know, if you don't believe it, uh, you're not intelligent, uh, type thing. Well, we know from the literature that's not the case, but uh, it's easy to make those statements because science is so successful in certain areas. Uh, that is able to extend its materialist philosophy, or its materialism, I should say, to its philosophy, and exclude God in the picture, and so on. So, uh, I think this bias is part of the issue that needs to be considered about the uncertainty issue. Well, I, I think that you're right, and uh, it's very important to distinguish between two two different kinds of sciences. Uh, one science is concerned with any explanation of the facts that makes any sense. Uh, one science is concerned with excluding uh, demons as as the um, as an explanatory factor. Uh, Carl Sagan wrote a book called Billions and Billions of Demons. Um, I'm reading. Uh, through John Draper right now, uh, Warfare of uh, Religion and Science. Um, and I'm getting ready to read more through Andrew Dickinson uh, White, uh, Andrew Dixon White, who uh, wrote a book with a very similar title. Uh, and I am struck uh, by how many of the arguments came straight out of Draper. Uh, Without any references whatsoever, as uh, some of the some of the things that are alleged to be true, um, some of them are probably true because I've read it from other areas uh, as well. Uh, the uh, churchmen don't always make good uh, scientists, uh, but some of it. Uh, You can see already in Draper the idea that you could either have miracles all the time or you could have no miracles and there's no, um, there's no middle ground between those two. And of course most Adventists, myself included, would find ourselves precisely in that middle ground, which means that the arguments that Draper is making don't really speak to me. Um, and 
uh, in billions and billions of demons, the implication that Carl Sagan makes is that you either believe in billions and billions of demons or you believe in none of them. And there is no middle ground between those. And uh, of course he's using demons in, in the sense of not just uh, bad <coughs> supernatural agencies but also good ones. He doesn't have room for God either. Um, I, I think that that's... Uh, uh, and of course, Richard Lewontin, when he reviewed that particular book, made the famous statements that we believe in science in spite of all of its difficulties of various kinds, which he goes on to list. He says, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism, moreover, that commitment is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And then the part that usually gets dropped is, he says, anybody who can believe in God can believe that anything could happen at any time. And, and this is, if you take that as your fundamental statement of belief, then I guess you'd have to say that Christianity is not going to fit with it. Because Christianity believes that at least once in history, and usually more often than just once, that God intervened specifically, came down, took human form, lived as a man, died, and then was resurrected and ascended to heaven. And, you know, not believing that is pretty much tantamount to not believing Christianity, period. It's believing that Jesus is a nice man who had a lot of nice things, but, uh, you know, it's too bad that he died, but uh, that was the end of it. Except that his teachings live on, I guess, somehow never mentioning that his teachings include that I will rise in three days. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> I, I think when we try to, let me put it this way, if that's the definition of science, then I agree that science and Christianity are at loggerheads and there is no compromise. If, on the other hand, science is trying to find the best explanation, then I think it's entirely possible that science and Christianity <coughs> may come to a very uh, amicable understanding. Yeah. Warren. I'd, I'd like to give... Uh this presentation a historical perspective uh, looking at the way Adventist physicists have tackled these problems. I think there's three camps. I may be oversimplifying. I may be overlooking some people. You can correct me. Um, the one camp has been, um, of course, the camp that we have answers. We can find scientific answers even in the area of physics. Um, there are the two Roberts that have uh, dealt with that approach, Robert Brown and Robert Gentry, going in quite opposite directions, but both uh, very convinced that we have answers. One, Robert Gentry, through the halos in his research, and there is something to what he's come up with, so there are some mysteries about halos. Robert Brown has suggested that we can trust the radiometric dates, but they date the minerals and not the fossils. Um, both of these camps within Adventism today, at least, have very little support among our trained physicists. Now, maybe among the layman it's different, but among our trained physicists, I don't see people writing a lot of articles in our church papers like Robert Brown did advocating the old, old earth, young life view. Uh, more theologians, I see Andrew's theologians have picked up the ball on that. We see quite a bit from theologians. The uh, other camp, which is, I say, the underground camp, is we have quite a number of Adventist physicists that say, yes, I can't refute the radiometric dating problems. Therefore, the Earth is old, the universe is old, and even life is old. They essentially have conceded 
the battle already, as you know. And I can name a few names, and some are still teaching in Adventist institutions now. I've talked with many of them personally. Uh, quite often they keep quiet. That's why I say this is kind of an underground thing. The um, middle of the road approach is the one of our author today. And there again, there's not a large number of Adventist physicists that are even advocating openly the middle road. That yes, we don't have the answers, we want to dialogue and keep the dialogue going. I think our own Ben Clausen would fall in this group quite easily. He wants to see the dialogue going and ultimately there will be solutions. But we so don't have them yet. It hasn't happened yet. Not something that you can really nail down, the silver bullet approach. So we have the three groups. And if you divide everything into thirds, each group is in a minority. See, when you compare it to all. And then there's another group, we might say, that um, they say, you know, um, we, we'll just keep quiet on the subject and, um, and just give physics the way it's taught in the traditional view, and we're not going to express personal views. So there's even a fourth group, and that, I don't know, might be a fairly sizable group, too. So uh, I could add one more name. Bill Mundy taught at PUC. He was into the expanding Earth model, and you've heard him lecture, and I've heard him. Uh, that's a novel way of trying to explain uh, continental drift and uh, magnetic field dating and all that. Outside Adventisms, we have John, Bar John Baumgartner, and he is looking at some very theoretical things about plate movements. So he's looking down below our, where we stand. There's one other, Russell Humphreys. He's redoing the science of the universe. So he's looking above for answers. The two are quite separate. They work together, but they haven't found meeting ground, common meeting ground. So that's where we're at. In a nutshell, a historical view, that's where we're at. And I don't know how it's all going to play out in the end. You know, it's an, it's an interesting question. What happens if we try to keep the dialogue open and then something comes through that just seems to be kind of a game changer? Yeah, that's what we're all hoping and looking for. Um, uh, I, I think there have been some fascinating developments. I, you know, personally, radiocarbon dating is probably mm -hmm. the uh, probably the the best friend of short age, maybe with the exception of genetic entropy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, that that hadn't happened until fairly recently. Um, and I, I think that it's also fascinating to, to see what uh, the ICR has done with Bob Gentry's uh, uh, helium data. Uh, their graphs are really pretty convincing. Um, <coughs> and as far as I know, there's, it's difficult to, to monkey with the graphs to make them fit. So it looks like it's a natural fit. Um, and I think, I think that that is a possible uh, way of resolving some of this, is that if you study it, um, perhaps after decades of research, something will pop up. Certainly that kind of thing happened with the unanswered questions about the Yellowstone Fossil Forest that didn't really get definitive answers, or at least uh, persuasive answers, until Mount St. Helens erupted. And if that's not, that wasn't exactly part of the research protocol. <laughs> so I think we had a question back. I'm thinking about um, someone coming to your door, say a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness. Mormon would be a better idea. 
uh, trying, and you're interested in trying to speak with them about the truth that you understand. As long as your basic ideas of what you believe are true, your sources of truth are different, I mean, how are you ever going to resolve it? One, you know, the Bible, the other, the Book of Mormon, primary. And will you ever convince the other, or will he ever convince you? Well, I, um, as, as long as one insists on hanging on to um, a different source of truth, there probably isn't much you can do about it. Uh, by the way, it's uh, 11.30 now, and I know some of you have to go somewhere. Um, but it's um, I, I think it's still possible to explore, you know, uh, and perhaps to start out with where do you find truth? Uh, if a uh, if a Mormon says, well, I find truth in two sources, the Bible and the Book of Mormon, um, then they're, they're, you, know, you can approach it from, well, we share the Bible at least. Um, and uh, how, how does one validate the Book of Mormon? And I, I think that that's an appropriate way to get started. Um, but I think that a lot of this will have this kind of, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't mean, I guess, that you can dialogue with everybody uh, because if you did that, I, you wouldn't have time to even think, uh, you know, or eat for that matter. Uh, but, um, but it does mean, I think, that when you, have, when you do take the opportunity to dialogue, it's not enough to simply compare results and stop there. And I think that that's what we often do. Um, it's also important to get down to the fundamentals of, well, what are your basic beliefs? If I'm dealing with somebody of the Richard Lewinton mindset, um, we may not be able to do much more than to say, okay, that's where you're coming from. <coughs> Here's where I'm coming from. It's a belief that God usually runs his universe orderly, but occasionally he steps in and does something different from the usual. And um, uh, for practical purposes where those events don't happen, we can have agreement. Where those events do happen, we're probably going to have to differ because you don't believe that, that there is a God who can step in at any point. And then, uh, you know, the only, the only thing is, what kind of evidence would make a difference? And, you know, if that's a fundamental belief and no evidence is going to make a difference, then, you know, smile at each other and uh, move on because there's probably not much point in going, in, going over uh, those kinds of arguments again. Um, but at least you've identified the root cause of the disagreement. Um, and I, I think that sometimes we deal with these things to too much of a superficial level, and we don't get down to the underlying authority level, uh, you know, who or what is in fact an authority for you. Uh, what are authoritative beliefs? Is you know, if, if you're dealing with somebody for whom there is no God, and therefore God can't intervene because he doesn't exist, um, and that is a fundamental principle which they're not willing to give up for any evidence whatsoever, uh, and all you can really do is say, have a nice day and treat him nice. I mean, what else do you do? If you're dealing with somebody who says, well, I believe in the Bible, it seems to me that the Bible says this, then we can say, well, let's explore what the Bible does have to say. Um, I don't know that we necessarily have the ability to reach 
everybody. Uh, and I don't even know that because uh, our theology may have some kinks that need working out. Uh, it may very well be that uh, in some cases our theology is too restrictive. Um, uh, that we have, we certainly don't have the right to walk up to people and say, well, you have to see it my way or else uh, goodbye. But I think that, that uh, if there is common ground, you can work with that. If there is not common ground, then you can acknowledge that and move on. Uh, we have a comment over here. Yeah, I comment. Thank you. In this point, I will say, let's move from the basic, as you mentioned, basic principles as Adventists, as Christian we are. We are Christian, and our focus is Christianity. Then let's go to the simple, to the difficult, no reverse. What is our model? What did he do? What did Jesus do in those cases? Did he try to convince? What he did try? What did Jesus tried to do? Did he try to convince? Or he tried to make a model, a life, a, a, a quality type of life, a, a understanding each other, loving each other, teaching what they need to be, do they need to know? a testimony, a courtesy, a welcome. And then after, when he saw the interest, then he talked about the rest, the gospel, the other sin, the salvation. But you, you, you uh, pointed at the beginning that uh, Jesus came for healed and saved. Then this is our model, then let's go as he did. Well, Jesus gave us um, different examples, and I'm not sure that you can take a simple rule from Jesus and be able to apply it to every person. There were some people for whom his interaction was, you guys have got it all wrong, badly wrong, and if you keep going the way you are, you're going to be lost. He, he used some rather strong language against um, certain kinds of practices by the religious conservatives of his day, the Pharisees. It's interesting, he didn't have much interaction with the Sadducees. We only have it recorded once where he actually interacted with them. Um, apparently there's just not enough common ground to even get started. And, you know, we always think about the Pharisees as being the ones that uh, that Jesus was hardest on, but I'd a lot rather have Jesus working on me as hard as he can than just saying, there's no common ground and I'm not even going to bother. Um, and the one time the Pharisees, uh, pardon me, the one time that he interacted with the Sadducees was when they came to him with a question, trying to disprove the reality of the resurrection. And... Uh, you know, he turned it around on them using, interestingly, their own assumptions as to what parts of the Bible were reliable. In their view, it was only the books of Moses. And because Moses didn't explicitly teach the resurrection, uh, that meant that the resurrection wasn't really taught. Um, so Jesus met them where they were. But it seems to have been not much of a conversation after that. Because... Those Sadducees who could see it saw it, and those Sadducees who didn't, didn't, and, and he didn't pound that one too hard. On the other hand, when he's dealing with people who, whose theological overlay isn't that heavy, he tended to approach them on a non-theological level. He tended to go after um, uh, uh, using, using their humanity to uh, approach them, you know, healing, teaching, showing concern for their daily lives, and then as they were ready, talking to them about the kingdom. 
And then, of course, there were the true seekers, and he, wa he would help them uh, as much as they could handle. And uh, it's interesting, even after three and a half years, why it appears that uh, they didn't really get it until after he had died and then risen again. Uh, because at the end they were still arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom and uh, and at the end none of them were willing to stand with him through through his trial and crucifixion that there was only a few women who because of uh, uh, if I could put it that way personal connection uh, uh, were willing to to uh, stand by his side uh, while he was being crucified. And I guess the Apostle John somehow saw it from a little bit of a distance, but, um, but most of the disciples had long since fled. And so uh, I guess if you're trying to use Jesus' example, probably what you do is you... Uh, are as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Uh, and, and there isn't really much else that you can say. You do the best you can with uh, what, uh, what you're uh, given. And sometimes that will mean gently confronting people with the evidence, and sometimes that will mean just simply being their friend. So it will vary. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I think that it's important for us, even if we're dealing with hard-nosed atheists, uh, to not put them too fast in outer darkness. That even with those, we need to be their friend as, as they will let us. That's my point. Yeah. That's my point, of course. Well, um, I guess we will see you all uh, uh, next week, and we'll be talking about radiometric dating.